Hello everyone, welcome to Apti Plus Academy for Civil Services, a premier institution for preparing for civil services in India. Today, I'm here for a daily news and editorial analysis for 25th and 26th of March 2024. And this editorial analysis is going to be important for all the government exams in India and all three stages of UPC, which are UPC prelims, mains and interview process. So without further delay, let us begin the analysis. Position on the five clusters of United Nations Security Council reform was articulated during the IGN session held in December last year and February this year. This position is clearly presented in the G4 model that we are putting forth touching on issues of enlargement of the United Nations Security Council, the right of the veto, and equitable geographic representation, amongst others. Recently, India presented a detailed model on behalf of group of four countries, which is the G4 countries, for reforming the United Nations Security Council. And in this context, this news becomes important for UPC prelims perspective and also for the GSP people to of UPC means. And under GSP people to this topic caters to the syllabus, groupings and agreements involving India and or affecting the India's interest. And in this topic, we are going to discuss about the news in detail. We'll discuss the G4 model, which have been presented by India. And we'll discuss the key features of the G4 model. And then we'll discuss the United Nations Security Council and its members. And lastly, we'll discuss the need for reform and the PYQ that has been asked from this topic. So without further delay, let us begin the analysis. Recently, India participated in the intergovernmental negotiations on Security Council reform. And in this forum, India demanded for the reform in the United Nations Security Council on behalf of group of four countries. And the group of four countries are basically Brazil, India, Germany, and Japan. So if you want to remember the G4 countries with mnemonics, there is a short text to remember uh, the group of four countries, which is Big Japan. So Big Japan is the mnemonic to remember the group of four countries, where B stands for Brazil, I stands for India, G stands for Germany and J stands for Japan. So these are the four countries which are demanding for the reform in the United Nations Security Council. So on behalf of the group of four countries, India demanded for a reform in United Nations Security Council. And the model mainly demands uh, for the new permanent members elected democratically by the United Nations General Assembly and flexibility on the veto issue. So basically this model aims to elect the new members in the Security Council. So the United Nations Security Council, which are basically uh, the monopoly of the five countries, we'll discuss about the members as well. So India basically uh, wants to reform the United Nations Security Council by including uh, the new members in the United Nations Security Council. And they also want the flexibility in the veto system. So the permanent five countries, uh, which are the members of the United Nations Security Council. Okay. So there are basically the five countries uh, which are part of uh, the United Nations Security Council. They have the veto power. So India basically wants that veto power to be flexible. Okay. So this is the basic model of the G4. And the G4 countries was created in 2004 and it has been promoting the Security Council reform. Okay. So you have to remember that G4 countries was established in 2004. So these are the important facts about the details of the news. So now moving on to important, so far as the key features of the G4 proposed model is concerned, India and the G4 countries are basically demanding the uh, addressing the underrepresentation in the United Nations Security Council and the United Nations. So you can see in the map, the P5 countries, which is the countries in the United Nations Security Council. So United Nations Security Councils are dominated by P5 countries, which are the China, Russia, France, United Kingdom, and United States of America. So these are the countries which dominates the United Nations Security Council. Okay. So these five countries also have the veto power. So any decision uh, which is being taken by the United Nations can be blocked by any of these countries using the veto power. Okay. So uh, for this reason, there is a dominance of these five countries in the United Nations Security Council. And you can see in the map, the South America is underrepresented or there is no representation 
of South America in the United Nations Security Council. There is no representation of Africa. There is also no representation of Southeast Asia and India, which is the largest democracy and the second largest population in the world, is not represented in the United Nations Security Council. So for this reason, United Nations Security Council needs a reform and the main demand of G4 countries is to reform the United Nations Security Council. And so far as the specific demand of the G4 countries are concerned, uh, the G4 countries basically aims to uh, expand uh, the membership of the United Nations from the current 15 to 25 to 26 members. So currently, the United Nations has the 15 members. So the G4 countries basically wants to increase this representation from 15 to 25. So United Nations Security Council, UNSC, has five members. So these United Nations Security Council members are called the P5 countries. Okay, so the G4 countries basically wants to increase the members in UNSC as well as United Nations. And flexibility has also been demanded by the G4. We discussed about it. And they also want to add six permanent members in the United Nations Security Council. So they want the United Nations uh, Security Council to be expanded to the 11 membered countries. So currently there are five members. Now with the inclusion of these six countries, the total members would be 11 countries. So this is the main demand of the G4 countries or the proposed model of the G4. And the model also demands for the democratic election process in the United Nations. So they also want the process to be democratic in the United Nations Security Council. So talking about the United Nations Security Council, the United Nations Security Council was established under the UN Charter of 1945. And this United Nations Security Council is one of the six principal organs of United Nations. So the United Nations has the six organs, comment the six organs of the United Nations in the comment section. And the United Nations Security Council comprises the 15 members. So there are 15 members in the United Nations Security Council. And this has been divided into permanent and non-permanent members. So permanent members are the five countries we discussed about it. And there are and non-permanent members. Okay. So this is the constituent of the United Nations Security Council and uh, the members uh, which are non-permanent in nature are elected for two years. So the non-permanent members of United Nations Security Council is uh, elected for the two years and the permanent members are uh, United States, Russian Federation, France, China and United Kingdom. So these are the permanent uh, nations uh, which are members of the United Nations Security Council. So these are the P5 countries. We discussed about it. And uh, they are also located in the map here. So these green shaded areas are the P5 countries. And according to Oppenheim's international law, in the United Nations, the permanent members has been given the seat based on their contribution in the World War II. So these countries, as per the Oppenheim's international law, made significant contribution to the World War II. So for this reason, these five countries have been given representation in the United Nations Security Council. Take care. So this is the Oppenheim's law. You need to know. And... Uh, this open hands law basically explains why these countries have been given the represented uh, patient as the permanent five countries. Okay, so you need to know about this fact. And uh, India's participation in United Nations Security Council has been as non-permanent members. So India has been represented in United Nations Security Council as non-permanent members for many years. So these are the years during which India was part of United Nations Security Council. Uh, as non-permanent members. Now let us discuss why is there need for the reform in United Nations. So far as the need for reform in United Nations Security Council is concerned, the underrepresentation of the countries in Global South and the legitimacy of the decisions made by the United Nations Security Council is the most important because the countries in Global South has no representation in the permanent membership in United Nations Security Council. And for this reason, the decisions made by the United Nations Security Council on behalf of the Global South countries is questionable because there is no representation of the Global South. And the voice of Global South is not there in the United Nations Security Council. So for this reason, the Global South demands the reform in United Nations Security Council. And they also want the inclusion of uh, the countries in Global South in the United Nations Security Council. And another important need for reform in UNSC is the outdated composition 
The composition of the United Nations Security Council was based on the geopolitical situation of 1945. And since the World War II, many things have changed. Many countries has evolved as the global economies. So the power dimensions has changed and also new economies are emerging. So, so for this reason, there is need for reform in United Nations Security Council. And, and uh, the reform which was done in 1963 or 65 was very uh, dismal. So only few members was added in 1963-65 and it has been many years since 1963 and 65 that no new countries have been added in United Nations Security Council. So for this reason, there is need for adding new members in United Nations Security Council based on the changing global political situations. And the third important reason for reform in UNSC is the recognition of the contributions of the countries. For instance, India contributes the highest number of soldiers in the United Nations Peacekeeping Force. So the United Nations Peacekeeping Force, which works in various conflict zones, for instance, Sudan, the Gaza Strip, etc. And in this organization, India has the highest number of peacekeepers. So despite having the highest number of contribution of soldiers in the United Nations Security Council, so despite having the highest number of soldiers represented in the United Nations Peacekeeping Force, India has not been represented in the United Nations Security Council. And the last and most important reason for need for reform in United Nations Security Council is the misuse of veto power. So the countries uh, which are the permanent five countries misuse the veto power that have been given to them. The countries like Russia, China, France, uh, Britain, etc. misuse the power of veto because these countries veto uh, the decisions made by the United Nations Security Council based on their own self-interest. So the self-interest of these countries are basically blocking the reform in the United Nations. And this is again threatening the global power system and the global peace. So for this reason, there is need for reform in the United Nations Security Council. So these are the reasons why the United Nations Security Council needs to be reformed. Now let us understand about the procedure for reforming the United Nations Security Council. So far as the procedure for the reform in the United Nations Security Council is concerned, the Article 108 of the United Nations Charter provides for the reform in the United Nations Security Council. And in the first stage, the voting is done in the General Assembly of the 193 member countries. And in this voting, the countries must endorse the reform with the two-third of majority, which is equivalent to at least 128 states. So 128 states must endorse for the reform in the United Nations, uh, which is the General Assembly of United Nations. And in the second stage, the amended charter is required to be ratified by the two thirds of the member states and which includes the five permanent Security Council members. So after the voting is done in the General Assembly, the states of the member countries must ratify this amendment. So after that ratification, or which is the ratification by the two third of the member countries, the amendment in United Nations Security Council can be done. So this is how the United Nations Security Council reform is done. And this is the procedure for the United Nations Security Council's reform. Now let us discuss the PYQ that has been asked from this topic. UPC in 2019 asked this question from the United Nations Security Council and the question was the Security Council of United Nations consists of five permanent members and the remaining 10 members are uh, elected by the General Assembly for the term of how many years and this question is pretty straightforward we discussed about uh, this look so comment the answer of this question in the comment section now moving on to the next topic of discussion for today. Recently, the state governments in India mobilized more than 50,000 crores using the state development loans or the government bonds. And in this context, this news becomes important for UPC prelims perspective and also for the GS paper 2 of UPC means. And other GS paper 2, this topic caters to this level, the monetary policy. And the point of discussion of this topic is going to be the details of the news. We'll discuss the news in detail. We'll discuss what are, what are the bonds. We'll discuss the bond types, the types of bonds or the government securities in India. And lastly, we'll discuss the PYQ that has been asked from this topic. So let us begin the analysis. So as we just discussed, the context of the news is that the recently the state government mobilized uh, 50,206 crore uh, through the state development loans. So this is the highest uh, demand of the state development loans um, by the private entities in India. And this was the higher than the target of the RBI, which was the 27,810 crore. And this indicates the robust demand for the state government securities in uh, financial markets. So this is very important point. 
and the SDLs, which is the state development loans, are the part of government securities. So SDLs are basically part of government securities where the state governments raise the loans from the market. So state development loans are basically part of government securities and SDLs are dated securities issued through the normal auctions similar to the auctions conducted for the dated security issued by the central government. So state development loans are basically uh, type of dated securities. So dated securities means the securities which has the fixed tenure. For instance, if the security has the 10 years of tenure, then that would be a dated security. So state development loans are basically type of dated securities. So this is the news in detail. So talking about the bonds, bonds are basically an instrument to borrow money in India. And the bond uh, could be float floated by the government as well as the company. So private sectors can also issue the bonds and uh, the state government bonds, which is also called the G6 in India. So government securities are basically issued uh, bonds, which are issued by government of India or the government. And the government bonds are basically called the G6. So G6 are basically the bonds which are issued by the government. And the government bonds are called treasury in US and guilds in UK. So if you come across the term guilt is bonds or treasury, then that is talking about the government bonds. So, so exam guilds is related to what kind of bond. So guilt is basically the government bonds and uh, this is the alternative name that is used in UK for the G6. And uh, the G6 or the government bonds are very important because they are considered the safest instruments of investment. Because they have the sovereign guarantee. Okay. So G sec mein, uh, government ka guarantee rehta hai. Isi liye G sec are considered the safest instrument for the borrowing. So these are the important facts about the bonds. And the government securities are classified into four types. Okay. So these are the four types of the government securities. Treasury bills is first type. Second one is the cash management bills. Third one is dated securities. Fourth one is state development loans. So we'll discuss about all these uh, type of government bonds in detail. Now let us discuss about them in detail. So talking about uh, the types of the GSEX, the first type is the treasury bills, which is the T-bills. And the treasury bills are the zero coupon securities. And the treasury bills are zero coupon securities. And the treasury bills pay no interest. So the interest is not given in the treasury bills. So this is a very important point. But instead of paying the interest, uh, the treasury bills are issued at the discount value. And they are redeemed at the face value at the majority. That means if the value of the treasury bill is 100 so if 100 is the face value of the treasury bills, then this treasury bill will be issued at 90 rupees, which is the discounted price. Okay. But when this uh, treasury bill is again bought by the government, this will be bought at 100 rupees. So 10 rupees, which is the 10% would be the profit of the buyer. So basically the tables are issued at the discount value and they are redeemed at the face value at the majority. So this is a very important fact that you need to know about the treasury bill. Treasury bills are issued at three tenors. So three uh, tenure. This is very important. And uh, this is issued at multiple of 91. So 91 into 2, 182. 182 into 2, that is 364. So these are the three tenors of the treasury bills uh, that you need to know about. And talking about the cash management bills, the cash management bills was launched by government of India in 2010. And it is a new short term instrument to meet the temporary mismatches in the cash flow of the government of India. So this cash management bill was launched by government of India to uh, address the temporary mismatch uh, in the uh, borrowings of government of India. Okay. So this is a temporary measure of government of India. Okay. Temporary requirement of government of India. Okay. So this is an important fact and the cash management bills are issued uh, for maturities less than 91 days. So this is the main difference between the T-bills and the cash management bills. So cash management bills are basically issued for less than 90 days and the treasury bills are issued for 91 days and more. So you have to know this fact. And talking about the dated securities, we discussed about it. Dated securities are basically Z6 that carry a fixed floating interest rate, which is paid uh, on the face value. So the dated securities carry the fixed interest rate. So unlike the T-bills, which is uh, issued at the discount value where no interest is given, 
in the date restricted or the interest is given at the fixed rate and generally the tenor of the date securities ranges from 5 years to 40 years so date securities means the securities which have the date which have the fixed tenure so fixed tenure and the fixed interest is the main characteristic of the dated securities and talking about the state development loans state governments also issue the loans uh, from the market so the state governments which uh, issues the loans is called the state development loans the loans which are issued by the state governments is called the state development loans so these are the main uh, instruments of the g6 or these are the main types of the g6 uh, that is found in india so these facts are very important for the upc prelims perspective and various one day exams now let us discuss the upc pyq that has been asked from the similar topic <clears throat> UPC in 2020 asked this question from the financial debt and non-financial debt and the question was in the context of Indian economy, non-financial debt includes which of the following? So options are housing loans owed by the households, amounts outstanding on the credit cards and the treasury bills. So out of these three options, which are not included in the non-financial debt. So non-financial debt means the debt which are not taken from the uh, banks take, uh, for financial institutions. So if the loan is not taken from the banks and financial institutions, so if the loans are not taken from the banks and financial institutions, then they are called the non-financial debt. So if you see the options, all these loans or all these things are not taken from the banks or the financial institutions. So for this reason, all these these are non-financial debt. So answer is D. So all these are non-financial debts. And the next question is, in the context of Indian economy, open market operation refers to what? So basically the concept of open market operation has been asked. So if you know about the open market operation, you can easily answer this question. So comment the answer of this question in the comment section. Now moving on to next topic of discussion for today. <laughs> Recently, India, Mozambique and Tanzania trilateral exercise was conducted and in this context, this news becomes important for UPSC prelims and especially for the mapping in UPSC. And in this topic, we'll discuss about the IMT trilateral exercise and we'll also do the mapping of India, Mozambique and Tanzania. So without further delay, let us begin the analysis. So as we just discussed, the India, Mozambique, Tanzania maritime trilateral exercise was conducted and uh, INS Sujata and INS Thiel from India also participated in this uh, exercise. So you have to remember these two names. So in one day exams, it is asked that recently in the India, Mozambique, Tanzania maritime exercise, which of the following ships from India participated? So you have to answer that. The INS Sujata and INS Teer participated in this exercise. And uh, this exercise demonstrated India's and Indian Navy's dedication to bolstering the maritime security and cooperation with the neighboring countries. So this uh, initiative basically boost uh, the India's initiative, which is the Sagar, which is the security and growth for all in the region. So the Sagar initiative of government of India is very important initiative, which aims to boost uh, the India's relations with the Indian Ocean countries. So for this reason, this exercise is important. And talking about uh, the Mozambique, the capital of Mozambique is Maputo. So Mozambique is, is here in the East African country and uh, the Tanzania is here and the capital of Tanzania is Dodoma. So these are the important facts about uh, Tanzania and uh, the Mozambique and uh, these are the Great Lake systems in Tanzania and uh, Dar es Salaam is also located in Tanzania. So Dar es Salaam is important because recently Dar es Salaam declaration was signed 
by the African Union. And this Dar es Salaam basically bans the trade of donkeys in the world. So donkey trade, which is prevalent in uh, the African nations, is banned by the Dar es Salaam Declaration. Okay, so you have to remember this point. So these are the uh, places in news and uh, these are the mappings of the Tanzania and Mozambique and uh, these are the lakes which are located uh, in the Africa and uh, these lakes are also called the Great Lakes in Africa. Okay, so you have to remember that the Great Lakes are surrounded by Malawi, uh, okay, Mozambique, Tanzania, etc. So these are the important mappings uh, that you need to know, uh, do about uh, the Tanzania and Mozambique and the East African countries. So these are very relevant for the UPC prelims perspective because the places in news are particularly asked in UPC prelims. And this was also the last news for today's daily news and editorial analysis. And today as well, I have come up with an important quote of the day for you. Now let us look at the quote that I've got for you. Today's quote of the day is very simple and the quote is, if you can dream it, you can do it. So this quote is self-explanatory and very important for all the government job aspirants in India because you have dreamt about clearing uh, government exams in India and you have also dreamt about clearing the toughest exam in India, which is the UPC CAC. So since you have dreamt about clearing the government job in India, you can also do it. So with this quote, I'm concluding today's session. We'll meet again in the next video. Till then, take care.